Thank you, Chris. Do a quick sound check in, in the back. Can you hear me okay? Try a little bit better. How's that, Ray? Let Chris adjust it a little better. How about that, Ray? All right, sounds good. Well, it's a, it's a treat to, uh, to get to join each and every one of you today. Uh, um, I, I didn't seek out this opportunity, but, but, but Jimmy tracked me down and hit me up, and I've, uh, I guess, had a history of, telling, history of having a hard time of telling Jimmy no. Um, and so with that said, here I am. Uh, may, maybe what's the most privilege is being able to represent agents today. And I know there's a lot of county extension agents for agriculture in the room today, uh, along with farmers. And I want to encourage you to work closely with your county agents. Um, farmers truly are uh, the, the key portion of the Cooperative Extension Service at the county level, working together, whether it's serving on, on a, an advisory council or hosting a research project or demonstration. It's the work with you that makes that possible. So uh, work closely with them. So with that said, I'm going to jump right into the topic that Jimmy asked me to cover today, and that's hay feeding strategies to build fertility in grazing systems. I want to start out by saying that although in extension sometimes we treat hay as if it's a four-letter word, I really enjoy producing hay. I find it both challenging and rewarding to go from one year to the next and trying to make this field do better this year than it did last year. Unfortunately, when that last bell of hay leaves the roller and I can count my yields and do my comparison, that's where the fun ends. So I've got to haul the stuff back to the barn, and that's a, that's a mundane task within itself. Th but then, hopefully, several months later, we've got the job of feeding that hay. And that's where I have the real problem, and if it was a little bit different scenario, I'd be going around the room and saying, you know, what's, what do you think the biggest challenge with feeding hay is, or why do you not like feeding hay? To save time, uh, I just tried to list some of those uh, on this chart. You know, we have many struggles when it comes to feeding hay in the winter time. Uh, it, it's a time management run, worry about the feeders uh, running empty, waste, pugging, environmental concerns, mud, tractor stock, disposing of waste. You know, the list goes on and on, and we could add to this list. It's also important to point out that the challenges that someone who may be starting out farming may be different than someone who's been farming most of their life, just the same as the challenges and concerns of someone who's a full-time farmer versus a part-time farmer may be different. And so for that reason, I, I truly feel that there's no one-size-fits-all approach to feeding hay, because uh, we all have many things that we have to keep in balance uh, during that process. I think Possibly the one thing that makes it worse is the time of the year that it occurs. So this uh, Facebook post we run, I believe, last winter, winter means mud. Uh, that has impacts uh, on, on our ability to, to get in the fields. It has negative impact on cattle. And it just makes things uh, a task that I don't enjoy uh, even less enjoyable. And it brings up the thought of, you know, wouldn't it be nice to be able to feed hay some time of the year other than the winter. Uh, maybe it wouldn't be so bad then. And, and, and I think there are some strategies that we'll, we'll briefly highlight uh, where that we can maybe uh, shift our hay feeding around just a little bit. Chris mentioned uh, earlier in the introductions, and it's the elephant in the room, and that's fertilizer prices. And uh, we, we have been through high fertilizer prices before, but never not uh, this high. And so this is just urea futures. This is pulled up in December. It just shows you uh, where the market's been uh, since back in the spring. And uh, really just head, heading into this fall, we see prices uh, uh, reach uh, well above $700 a ton. Uh, and we've still got to get that product shipped to Kentucky. When I checked local fertilizer prices in December, by local, I'm, I'm in Adair County, that's south central Kentucky, I was quoted $900 per ton on urea, $850 per ton on diammonium phosphate, and $800 per ton on murate of potash. And if you've been tracking or following along or, or, catching, or, or checking prices frequently, we, we have seen a little bit of movement I think mostly in, uh, in that and urea, and that seems to be softening up. 
hopefully, uh, hopefully that will continue to do so. So as we think about trying to, to, to use our, our hay feeding strategies uh, to improve uh, fertility, I think a good place to start is trying to determine, well, what, what's a bale of hay really worth in terms of, of, of fertility and the nutrients that it contains? And obviously that took a, took a big change uh, this year with these prices. So to start with this, uh, you've got to figure out how much a bale of hay weighs. And uh, I recruited the help of a uh, colleague, uh, uh, Brandon Sears, county agent for agriculture in Madison County. Him and one of his interns in 2013 conducted a, a study where they went around their county and weighed several bales of hay on different farms. And you can see the different size of bales uh, that they uh, weighed, a huge range uh, in differences even within the same size. And then we see our average uh, bale weight. And so a five by five is about 1,000 pounds, five by six, 1,500. Small square, square bales, 39. What I found interesting is they, they, they never found a single square bale of hay that weighed 50 pounds, and I thought they all weighed 50 pounds, Jimmy. <laughs> So now if I take those fertilizer prices that I showed you just a few moments ago and I assign a value based on that for, for nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, if I assume, just using that of AGR1, that's our, our soil fertility uh, publication, we're assuming uh, 35 pounds of nitrogen, 18 pounds of phosphate, 50 pounds of potassium uh, per ton uh, of grass hay. We come up with the nutrient replacement costs as follows in this chart here. So a five by six, almost uh, 60 bucks, $58. Those small squares, $1.51 per bale. That's not making any uh, deductions in those calculations. I'm not trying to account for what the cow's going to utilize or how much we're going to lose from environmental factors. That's just straight calculation. Sometimes you see that calculation varied. So we think about the value of that hay and we think about uh, a, a common scene we see during winter feeding. In this picture we can see uh, hay is being fed on the edge of the field. Actually it's uh, within the woodlands just a little bit and I guess you say the thought process is well let's, let's try to uh, increase our pasture acreage this year, knock out a few briars and weeds and thickets, and build some fertility uh, at the same time. And I guess that has its merits because we're also protecting uh, some pasture land. But at the same rate, if we continue uh, to feed hay there over a long period of time or for multiple years, I do believe it's a missed opportunity because of all the nutrients that we will accumulate in that single area. And so if we look at things just a little bit different, instead of looking at what's going in the cow, let's take a look at what's going out of the cow during a winter feeding. This, uh, this screenshot, this is a, a clip out of our Kentucky Nutrient Management Plan Calculator. Uh, if you've participated in a, in a, in a project uh, building, uh, developing a fence line feeder or hay pad with uh, soil conservation, you may have been instructed to visit with your county agent to develop a nutrient management plan. And so that's what this calculator is part of. And so what I've used this tool for in this uh, example is try to calculate the amount of manure produced during a winter's feeding, imagining that we're somehow going to be able to capture every drop of it so that we can then utilize it back uh, somewhere else where it may be needed. So the assumptions I made was a, was a 40 cow beef herd, average weight of 1,200 pounds. I plugged in 20 calves uh, at an average weight of 300 pounds. I assumed a 120 day feeding period. Hopefully that's longer than most anybody's feeding hay, but I know several that do. From there, it gives us a calculation of 291 tons of manure produced during that feeding season. Then it calculates how much nutrient is in each ton, eight pounds of nitrogen, 4.1 pounds of phosphorus, 6.6 .6 potassium. Something important to point out, and I'll bring back up later, is we're just looking at manure. Well, urine contains nutrients as well. In fact, it contains a fair large portion of nitrogen and potassium. So we're not even we're not even accounting for what nutrients is passing through the cow's urine. 
So then I wanted to go a bit further and say, well, let's try to uh, assign a dollar value to that manure. And at this point, we did, I did pull in some in, in, in environmental factors and, and realizing we're not going to retain all of that nitrogen nor that phosphorus. And so the nutrient management calculator also performed these calculations for me. We only assumed that uh, about 25% of that nitrogen was going to be available, 80% of phosphorus, and 90% of the potassium. So those original numbers get reduced down, pounds available there. And then we have the value of each nutrient separately and then per ton. And it comes with up to $7.69 per ton. If we go forward then, carry the 291 tons that we calculated earlier, and we've come up with a little over $2,200 in value in the manure produced in that example herd. And I know there's no way that we can ever retain all of those nutrients. are likely uh, not a feasible, sensible way to do so, but it should be our goal to try to get as much of those back into our production system as we can. And we can look at and consider and evaluate some of our hay feeding strategies and try to determine how might best fit us on our farm to do that. So we'll start out by considering uh, fence line feeders. And fence line feeders have become very popular in recent years and, uh, and that's credit to, to Dr. Steve Higgins. Um, you know, they're, they're very popular. Uh, folks are very proud of them and rightfully so. I, I cannot think of, a, of another way that we can be more efficient in terms of our labor and time spent on the tractor. It's, uh, they're very um, uh, user friendly, more designed for, for the farmer in ease. I always tease farmers when they install these. I say, that's really nice. That's gonna cost you a muffler here in about two to three years because your tractor's not gonna run long enough at one period of time. We do have uh, about a half a dozen or so uh, of these constructed in Adair County. The folks who have used them have, have, have really enjoyed them. Important to recognize that the key to success in terms of trying to make these structures give us a return in fertility is how often and how good of a job we do uh, scraping, cleaning those pads, and getting that material into a fertilizer spreader and then putting it somewhere where, where that it is needed. When we develop a nutrient management plan, for either a, a fence line feeder or a hay feeding pad, uh, they tell us to, to assume or estimate that we'll only capture about 30% of the nutrients coming out of that cow or 30% 30, 30 of the manure. That may be a bit optimistic, but that's the assumption that we make whenever we're running through a, a nutrient management calculator. From there, we would want to identify fields to put that on more times than not, that is going to be a hay field. The feeding pads that are on out and uh, placed on out in the field, sometimes along the field ed borders, have been more popular. There's been far more of those uh, constructed, but that's, that idea has been around for much longer as well. I mentioned earlier uh, that, you know, it'd be nice to sort of move our hay feeding periods around a little bit. And, and one thing that I've had a few farmers uh, mentioned in recent years is uh, with their spring cabin, by the time cabin season comes along, and uh, sometimes it's hard to keep these pads as cleaned off as well as we'd like. Cows spend a lot of time there, start having calves born, laying in this area, and before you know it, you all know what happens with calves and manure, we end up having scourge. And so what the, some of those farmers have done is they've saved their stockpile fescue on into that, some of those wetter periods of the year whenever we start uh, having calves hit the ground, actually moving away from some of these feeding structures. And so there are some strategies to try to shift away from some of the mud that we deal with during the winter feeding. So I'm going to take a, a, a big step in the other direction, about as far away from a fence line feeder as we can go, and that's uh, discussing bell grazing just a little bit. Uh, bell grazing's concept I know I'd never heard of until Jeff Lemcooler mentioned it to me as some years ago he was looking for some agents to do some some, some county demonstrations and, and experiments and he run the idea by me I said Jeff I, I think I know a farmer who could do that he's actually sitting up here near the front of the room uh, this is Mr. Fred Thomas's 
place in Adair County. I called up Fred. He said, Nick, I've been reading about that. I've been, been interested in trying that. So here we go. So Fred, that's been some years ago, and you're still bell grazing now. And so uh, needless to say, Fred has found that it works very well for him. And I'm not going to spend uh, the whole presentation talking about bell grazing today because you've seen it in other areas and other places you can read. But I describe this picture as, uh, I guess, moderate density bell grazing. De uh, Fred's uh, spacing about 100 to 200 feet uh, in between his hay bales and rotating the cows through the field during the winter months. Now, let me back up. Pay close attention. See this really green area right here on this ridge? So that, that area zoomed up, but from a few years prior, this is the first year that Fred bell grazed. This is when Jeff and I worked with him. And uh, I guess we, are, we were too optimistic in, uh, in how much the cattle might damage the land that year. And so we spaced bells about 50 feet apart. We got excellent nutrient distribution. Uh, you couldn't take a step without finding the pile. Unfortunately, we wreaked havoc on that forage stand. Good side of that, so we, 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 we ruined some infe infected fescue, rotated it with a sedan grass through the summer, and then went back with a, with a novel endophyte fescue in that area. And that's, that was that real green patch that you saw in that previous picture. And so with bell grazing, you always get worried about, you know, how much are we going to damage the existing forage stand. In some situations, it may be the goal. We've got to be careful and balance environmental concerns, and we did there. We had plenty of buffers in between uh, uh, water drainage areas. But we can, we can use bell grazing a, a various number of ways. What I can consider low density space bells real far apart, minimize the damage, or if you want a, a lot of damage, a lot of nutrient dist uh, density distributed, we can put them really close together. Looking here, this is, this is on Fred's farm. Previously, before bell grazing, Fred was feeding hay uh, in the same area each year. Uh, and this chart uh, labeled bottom, bottom of a hill. It fed hay there for some time. You can see what the nutrient levels were. Phosphorus was nearly 600. Potassium was over 900. That, those phosphorus levels are to the point where they start becoming an environmental concern. They can leach and, and, and move off-site and end up contaminating water resources. This pre-chart shows a, a, a phosphorus of 30 and a potassium of 104. That is the area that we just looked at where we done the high density bell grazing. Previously this field had been been part of uh, Fred's, uh, one of Fred's hay fields because it, the nutrient levels were so low it was cost prohibitive to put the amount of fertilizer that was really needed on those fields, and so we be, began grazing it, and then later, of course, bell grazing. If we skip over here to this line where it says post, we can see that our phosphorus levels from just that one year of high density bell grazing went from 30 to 90, our potassium levels went from 104 to 349. Now those are extremely large increases in soil fertility in a very short period of time. Granted, some of that may have be skewed a little bit from where our nutrient distribution was so dense. But that following summer, Fred successfully grew sedan grass in that area with zero fertilizer inputs. And then developed uh, back into tall fescue. If we look, uh, just a big picture of his farm across his, his whole farm. These were some samples that he had pulled himself looking from 2014 to 2021, how we've seen improvements in his soil fertility. 2014, he is running 23 to 31 on phosphorus, 71 to 75 on potassium. Fast forward modern day, mid 160s on phosphorus and uh, still really high, really high potassium levels. Still yet, we're, we are keeping those phosphorus levels where the, we're not a, posing a great environmental concern. But I think you can see from, from these soil test results why Fred has continued to, to bell graze on his farm. This is another picture a friend sent me uh, a, a few weeks back. Just a, a screenshot from Google Maps of a, of a ridge that he, that he had bell grazed. 
And uh, it was one of those fields that really didn't have a forage stand on it. It, uh, it had a lot of broom sedge. And those are my favorite fields to Belgrade because there's nothing to lose. You can, can't go anywhere but up in those fields in terms of trying to improve them. He ended up rotating, has been rotating that field in between a sedan grass and, and, and a winter wheat typically, but it made me think of an idea. I'd love to go in that field in mid-August with some cereal rye, and then later on, maybe sometime in November, do a very low density bell grazing on that field, come back, re revisit again late winter, and do another low density bell grazing on that field. And by having that fresh, immature, actively growing forage and some hay, I can sometimes balance out those nutrient needs those cows have. So there's a lot of ways to, to utilize this practice. I will admit, personally, I cannot force myself to bell graze in the field with that good of a stand of grass. That's 30 days of regrowth in mid-June, folks. It's good stuff right there. But I will say this. Two years prior, that field had been bell grazed. High density. So you may look at bell grazing and say, hey, I'm not doing that because I don't want to ruin what I've got. Well, you may end up with something better than what you had. And so it's a real way to, to, to renovate and improve some of our fields. Moving along, I do not have uh, as many folks around the county that, that are unrolling hay, and, and, and most of them who do, uh, or do not have a, a machine such as this, but they've, they've got a lot of hills on their farm. And that is an effective way of unrolling hay, whether on purpose or on accident sometimes. But I think uh, it, unrolling hay obviously does have, a mer have its marriage. You know, whether it's bell grazing or unrolling hay, we mentioned a while ago, a large amount of our nitrogen and our potassium's in the urine. Cow standing out in the field and she takes the bathroom, it's probably going to be placed a lot better than it would if she's standing on the gravel pad. And so there's value in that that we, we can't obviously hardly quantify or calculate. Jimmy let me borrow that picture. I appreciate that. While you may not unroll any hay, I would argue that, that we all produce some hay from time to time, maybe every year, that would probably be better suited for unrolling. I think a lot of folks have those fields with just a little bit of Johnson grass in it that you wait until the fescue gets tall enough to cut before you go in there and cut the whole field. And by that time, the Johnson grass is as tall. And the cows don't eat that. And whether it's in a fence line feeder, this is a fence line feeder that I showed you earlier. This is in a, in a field that was bell grazing. Uh, and that fence line feeder, uh, the best use of that I've found is to, that's really good at shearing a pin in a manure spreader. And uh, bell graze, and you can either pitch fork it away or, or you can set it on fire. And so maybe that's, maybe we all need to unroll just a, a portion of our hay to try to get used to the nutrients and just per, to prevent a headache uh, later on. You know, we've been focusing on all feeding hay, but we cannot overlook the value of extending the grazing season. I, I consider that counts in this topic because we're trying to get the most out of our fertility. What better way than recycling nutrients? This is Jason Stevens in Adair County doing a great job strip grazing. You can see how narrow of bands he is providing those cows at a time. Up here at this barn, he had a pad there, so he is able to, uh, to keep some hay out and use the hay bale as sort of an indicator of when he, when he needed to move. Done a great job there. He's getting good nutrient distribution. Keep in mind, I mentioned earlier, stop out fescue keeps. It's good in November, but it's good in January too. Done tests where it even still looks pretty good in February. And so you can save that back to a time when it's really needed or, or a time to get away uh, from a hay feeding area. Also winter annuals, Barney James, another Dare County farmer, uh, he, has, he has included winter annuals full force into his forage program each year. He uses fields that's got a high uh, amount of crabgrass and low, low, low amount of fescue and orchard grass. Drills them every year. Sometimes he'll do wheat, sometimes cereal rye, sometimes annual rye grass. Some fields he'll put cereal rye, cereal rye and annual rye grass both in them. He told me this year that he was, he, he was going to try bell grazing himself. He just wanted to set up a field of, of sedan grass to run some stalkers on this summer. So with that, we're, 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 I guess, finishing up where we started. The last time 
that we saw high fertilizer prices, the most common practice that I saw adopted among Adair County farmers was they quit taking second and third cuttings of hay. They either found a, 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 a permanent fence or temporary fence to fence off their hay fields. Take the hay cutting in the spring, because that's where we get the largest production in, in a cool season stand of grass, and then the remaining part of the year, graze those fields. And so we're greatly reducing the amount of nutrients we're pulling off that field and later recycling through grazing. And what they found, as long as they do a good job uh, not overgrazing, rotating across those hay fields, they can graze those without having a, a negative impact on their hay yield the following year. And so with that said, you know, the, I think the question on everyone's mind is, uh, how do we weather through the fertilizer prices of, of 2022? And if I were to come up with a very quick one word answer, and that's or two word answer, that's grazing management. I think that's gonna be the key moving forward. And, and fertilizer's high, and yes, we gotta have it, but we can squeeze so much more production out of our forages just through our grazing management and rotational grazing strategies. So with that said, I always like to leave on a positive note. This is my little girl here helping me uh, uh, put up a uh, uh, temporary fencing. When I was a kid, I, growing up, uh, bottling dairy calves, but uh, she's growing up moving posts. She's doing a quite good job of it. Second slide, had the chart with all the things, all the things we have to keep in mind. You know, we have to manage your time, your mud, and environmental concerns, and nutrient needs of the calves. We've got to manage your family too. So get creative in ways of incorporating them in what you do. Appreciate the opportunity to come and talk with you. We've built in uh, 10 minutes for questions and discussion. And if you want to bring your producer up to answer questions, too. Sure. Yeah. Fred. So, I know it's a little uh, not a surprise, but can you come up and answer some questions about what you've been doing on your farm? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Don't spot. You got to share a mic. Okay. Is there any questions for Nick or Fred? I start by setting out all of my hay sometime in the fall. Maybe you know, as I cut the grass cutting. Um, so all my hay moves over the kitchen already. And then what I do is I run it back up. So I fail, I occasional graze throughout the summer. And so I have 12 different patterns set up. So then when I set my hay out, I set the hay into those patterns. And what I found is if I set about four rolls per acre, that seems to be working for me. I've tried different density rates. But if I set those rolls out and then I, I cut my paddocks, my rotational grazing paddocks, into those acre sections, maybe an acre and a half, and I run a, an electric fence between those four or those six rolls. Sometimes I go six, depending on what the weather is looking like. Um, and then when I'm, when I'm ready to open that paddock up to those cows, I just call them up, they go in there, and they can only go up to that temporary electric fence that I've sectioned it off with. But in the meantime, as they're eating that up, I'm laying out more sections behind them or in front of them so that when it's time to move them again, I just pull up that first wire, and that second wire is already up there, and they just move on into that. Um, and I do that pretty much all winter, all fall and all winter long um, until I've got everything laid out and figured out my rotation um, depending on how they're eating it and what the weather is doing and there's a couple other variables. But, and I, I also have a couple of fields that I pack a denser area, you know, more rolls so that I basically have them turn it up and then I follow them with repairs and seeding and whatever else needs done. Yes, um, uh, I do. I use hay rings. Um, I, over the years, I've, I've purchased up, I've got six hay rings now. And when they're done with a roll, and you know, cows, they, 
they go to the roll they like best and they'll eat that up and then the other three haven't been touched. Well, I'll pick that roll up. Actually, me or my grandkids pick it up. It's easy, you stand it up on end and you roll it. It's a big wheel. Um, and we roll it ahead of the cows into the next section so that when it's ready, and I've got a time so I don't have to be out there in the cold rain and stuff, you know. I, I, I do that so I just go out and pull a wire and, and it's already done for them for the next section. Is it more more work than um, just feeding hay in the traditional manner? It's different work. It's more manual work. It's, it's, it's not as easy as going out into your tractor, starting it up and going and setting four or six rolls out as they need it. Um, it's more manual work, though it's, I don't mind it because it's, it's easy work. My grandkids can do it. I mean, my little grandkids, not just, you know. Um, so it's basically just pulling up some posts. I use rebars, one wire, and I just move that and keep moving it that way. The hay rings, sometimes, you know, they're a little heavy if it's muddy out or something. But I, again, I try to time it so that I don't deal with that nasty stuff. I don't start my tractor hardly all winter, um, so I don't have to keep it plugged in. I actually save seven bucks on my electric bill a month. Yeah, I mean, you know, just another savings. Um, and and uh, I just don't start my, my, my tractor in the winter time is a tool pouch that I use to move my wiring. It's a hammer and two uh, wire cutters and, and a, a pair of, and a screwdriver. That's it. Any other questions? For me? Well, um, I've, I've dealt with water access in a couple of ways. I have several springs on some of my hillsides. Um, but I also, I installed a water system that drains mo the water off of my barn roof. You probably saw it in the picture there. It captures the rain and every inch and a quarter of rain that I get, I fill up 2,800 gallons of, of water for them. So that helps, but sometimes they still have to walk down the hill to get to the springs. And I, I also have some, some other water sources. I don't use county water. Um, so water's taken care of mostly that way. Um, what was your first question? Oh, head of cattle. Stocking rate? Yeah. Over the years, I've been doing it since 2016. Um, it's varied, but I guess if I was to pull an average, I'd say 35. Um, and, you know, it's sometimes been 43 and sometimes been 28, but 35 is a good number. I use a five by six roll, and it's. I, I think it's uh, important to note that when I first started bale grazing, well, no, I'm sorry, prior to bale grazing, when I was feeding hay five by six, um, they were they consumed minimums three quarters of a roll, um, you know, and now I'm using at the most two thirds of a roll. So my hay usage is down. Somebody once asked me, don't you have a lot of waste? And I said, no, I don't really because, you know, the, uh, in fact, I was going to take a picture of it uh, yesterday, the day before. The, uh, the waste that, you know, some people say is always six inches. Well, that must be a couple years old hay sitting out in the rain because I never get that. I always get about this much that, that looks like it would be waste, but they end up eating it. Um, so I'm using less hay. Um, I this year I'll probably use 82 to 85 rolls of hay, um, and that's you know that's uh, nice for me because I don't have to go out and buy hay at that. Um, the uh, I, I don't know I'm I'm just finding I'm using less hay and the waste is not nearly as bad as what it used to be. The hardest thing for me to do is to um, is when it especially bad weather. That they've eaten the hay rings down to, to, you know, just a little bit of hay left in the ring. And it's really hard for me not to move them to get some new hay. And they holler at me. They, they fuss at me. They want that new hay. But if I, if I hold the line, I don't look at them much. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I'll get to you girls, you know. Um, if, I, if, if I make them eat it, they eat it. And then I do just go up and pull the next one in. 
But you know, the first thing they do when I open up the new section is they go to my stockpiled grass. And uh, I guess that's good. Um, and and the, the, the one negative that I see, and I haven't, I haven't figured this out yet, but I'm, I'm getting closer to it, is once they eat that stockpiled grass down and then start to eat the hay, and in the spring, I have little stubbles there that have to kind of regenerate the growth. And so now I'm, I'm rotating them through the bale grazing even so that I keep them off a section so that it gets a little bit of a jump start in the spring and it'll grow quicker once it starts growing. So that's, that's uh, I'm fine tuning that part of it. Any other questions? They like to eat it. <laughs> Could I make a quick comment sure, when he's done? Sure. Okay. I want to add one point. Um, this really scared me the, the first year or two or maybe even three that I did it in terms of my pasture renovation. The, the, uh, I'll call them scabs, okay? Some people might call them scars, and I was afraid they were scars. The, the circles on my field from that drone shot where I had set the bales, um, I thought, oh my goodness, what have I done to my fields? But they really are just field scabs. They're not field scars. It, they regenerate. If, if, I, if I'm done one year, they've regenerated before that summer is over. It's growing grass out there. So those scars or scabs go away. It, it really isn't much of a concern for me. So. One, one more question, and then we need to move on to the next speaker. Okay, right here, sir. Uh, I haven't yet figured out how your water system works across the field. Why? You're not piping it across the field and all that. No, but I have my paddocks laid out so that they can get access to water, depending on where they're at. Um, if, for example, five of my 12 paddocks, they come to a, a section where I can water them out of, each paddock as they're in it. And then another another side of my farm that I don't have that watering system, they have to go to the springs. And I have it laid out so um, they really don't have to travel very far. I, I've tried to minimize that because they burn calories going down and up the hill. Um, I I do have a section though where I just don't back fence them. They, they, have, they go up and down that whole open field now because I've taken the sections out. Um, and, and I'm getting pretty good manure distribution from it, too. All right. Let, let's thank Fred and, and Nick for that wonderful presentation.